So good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to what will be the first in five uh, uh, webinars dealing with media trust. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, the issue of uh, declining uh, trust in the media, which has, which has been going on for a while. And we have uh, five sessions that deal with this. Today, we're going to give you an overview of uh, what's going on and maybe why and if there's anything we can do about it. Uh, I'm Rod Hicks. I am the journalist on call for the Society of Professional Journalists, and I will be the host uh, this afternoon. And now uh, I want to introduce to you the uh, panelists who we, who we have joined us today to help with this discussion. First of all, we have Joy Maya. Joy, uh, just introduce yourself briefly. Sure. Hi. I run a project called Trusting News. We um, study how people decide what news to trust, and we train journalists in what they can be doing every day to demonstrate credibility and show why they are themselves worthy of trust. Happy to be here. Thanks. Okay. And then we have uh, Jeff Godfrey. Hi, I'm a senior researcher at the Pew Research Center um, and on the journalism research team. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Pew Research Center, we are a nonpartisan, um, non-advocacy think tank um, that studies a lot of trends um, and attitudes in America and around the world. Um, and I'm happy to be here to discuss this with you. Okay. And we have uh, Matthew Pressman. Matt? Hi. Thanks, Rod, and thanks to all the attendees. I'm an assistant professor of journalism at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. And my research focuses on the history of the American press, particularly the values and practices of major US news organizations. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, um, the, the, um, we, we've known for a while that trust in the press has been declining. And uh, Jeff, I know that you've written a book about this to some extent, but we, uh, the public sort of trusted us uh, a good deal. I think most people back in the 1970s, and it's been on a downward trend since then, a little bump um, most recently in 2016. But for the most part, we went from 70 something percent in the 1970s to somewhere in the 40s now, and that's uh, according to a Gallup poll. So first of all, I wanna just throw out to, to you guys, why do, the tr why do the press not, why do the public not trust the press, at least a, a good share of the public? Joy, what, what do, are we doing something wrong? Well, there's a lot about, um, there's a lot about our culture that has changed and the relationship between institutions and people that has changed since the late 70s when trust peaked um, a few years after Watergate when people are all fired up about the power of the press. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, deregulation of the industry, the rise of talk radio and cable news, there's a, even before the internet, there was a lot happening in the way people get information that changed, that, that increased their ability to get information that, that was more niche, that agreed, that they agreed with, that kind of confirmed their viewpoint on the world. Um, and then the internet, uh, you know, put the business model of, of journalism at such risk. And, um, and then you add on the partisan politics layer of, you know, actual messages coming and saying journalists are the problem and they're the enemy. So it's a whole host of reasons. Right. Now, now Jeff, you've done some research on the partisan aspect of this, right? What can you, what can you uh, tell us about that? So, um, First, I want to start off by saying that trust is a very multidimensional, it's a very complicated concept. And so there's a lot that you have to unpack and what you actually talk about when you talk about trust in the news media. And so there are these blunt measures that sort of measure that, but there's also a lot of other things underlying that, which is what we try to do at the Pew Research Center is to look at all these other aspects, whether it's accuracy, whether it's ethics, whether it's um, perceptions of bias or the watchdog role. So there's a lot of things that, that are unpacking in there. And so you have to figure out sort of what do what are the perceptions of each of those different aspects? In terms of the partisanship, um, what we do see is that partisan divides on um, various aspects of trust in the news media are vast. And they have widened in the wake of the 2016 presidential election. And so we saw that, yes, there were divides that have been around for a long time. But in the wake of what we saw in the past few years, a lot of these divides that we're seeing are often at historic levels. Um, and so, for example, on perceptions of the news media's watchdog world or perceptions of whether the news tend to uh, favor one side in covering. Um, 
Another part of that is, and I know we're kind of not gonna talk too much of this, is, that is the role of the president in all of this. And we do see that support for the president does exasperate some of these divides um, and does do that within party as well. So we see differences within the Republican party, for example, based on support, their support of the president. When the president says that you cannot trust the press, is that having traction uh, out in the public, with the public? Well, we don't have data that speaks to anything specific to what he's saying and tying any specific rhetoric to, um, uh, into actual views. But what we do know is that his strongest Republican supporters tend to be the ones that are the most negative. And it tends to be along the lines of some of his criticisms, um, whether it's in ethics um, via, or, or in uh, perceptions of, the, of um, whether criticism keeps political leaders in line. Um, and so a lot of those you do see that his strongest Republican report, um, supporters are the ones that have the most negative attitudes on those, on those views. Okay, a couple of you have mentioned uh, ethics. Do, um, do journalists have a problem with ethics or is that just the perception of the public? Anybody? Matt, you wanna try Sure, to I mean, I think to address the larger question of trust, uh, certainly the perception of journalist ethics is important. Um, and, you know, Joy mentioned Watergate and the perception of journalists back then. And I think the perception of journalists in popular culture matters a lot, too. The big popular culture artifact of the 1970s when it came to journalists was the, the book and the film All the President's Men, which depicted journalists in this heroic role. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole field of study about the image of the journalist in popular culture. But uh, most of the images that we've gotten more recently are are pretty negative with, with a few exceptions like the movie Spotlight. Uh, they're mostly pretty negative showing journalists doing totally unethical things and you know everything in pursuit of the story and doesn't matter you know how sleazy they are or who they hurt uh, and I think that's uh, that's a big part of it too and and also that uh, the tendency to kind of conflate the the media as a whole you know the media with whatever one news outlet that a news consumer sees doing something that they uh, disagree with or or find unethical you know uh the tendency to say oh well because uh tmz reported this uh the celebrity story in a sleazy manner you know therefore the media has an ethics problem um and now i'm not saying that there that there aren't ethical lapses all the time and certainly there have been a lot of uh high profile screw-ups by uh by prominent news organizations in recent years uh, but I think, uh, I think that's part of the issue too. You want to say something about that, Joy? I do. I think that I, definitely there are problems with ethics in journalism. There are problems with ethics in any field. And I think it's really important to remember that um, things, happen, things are done in the name of journalism all the time that make me really frustrated. I just want to throw my shoe at the TV. I'm like, why, why, are, you, why are you leaving out this important context? Why are you making it seem like that's the full story? Why are you slanting it that way? Why... Uh, why, why, why? And so I think it's important to remember that skepticism among news audiences is, I think, a valuable trait. I would like P Americans to be skeptical of where they get, to be careful where they get their news, to be it's the same thing I tell my 17 year old, like, who's giving you that message? Are they here to inform you or persuade you? Um, you know, are, are they likely to include information that contradicts their original hypothesis? Like all the things that make journalism responsible definitely are not universal. So I think the important thing is for us to think about what makes our journalism ethical and fair and responsible, not the media. Do you think that that is um, intentional or sloppy work or both? Or... I think it's most often sloppy work. I okay, think there not... are places. Well... Okay. One of the things that you hear from people, I, I, did, a, um, I did a study uh, in Casper, Wyoming last year where I got together a group of people, some on the, uh, are viewing this um, this webinar as a matter of fact but we, we talked about one of the issues that came up a lot was bias there are people in that group who you who, who are convinced that there's deliberate bias in the reporting that journalists do now is is, is that valid is is there some uh, widespread bias that journalists are trying trying to um, insert in their news stories? 
I mean, I think it's dangerous to have generalizations. I think there absolutely is honest bias. You know, some organizations that say, here's where we're coming from. I think there is dishonest bias where people are purposefully hiding what they're trying to accomplish. I think that does happen. Um, I think there's a lot of, I think journalists learn to set their personal, I mean, everyone has bias, everyone's coming from somewhere. Sure. And so I think journalists learn to set that aside and newsrooms I've been lucky enough to work in, we, we do a pretty good job, I think, of holding each other accountable for setting aside that bias and pointing out where we may have left something out or have holes in our coverage. Um, some newsrooms are better at that than others. I, I worry sometimes that newsrooms don't take as much, as much time for that as they should. So I think it's a whole host of answers, but I think the suspicion, I mean, it's, it's, it's sometimes within good reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, to what extent is um, uh, cable network news playing into, into this? If you want to hear um, news that is favorable to the president, you turn on Fox News. If you want to hear news that's not favorable to the president, you turn on MSNBC. And there are other conservative uh, media, radio uh, in particular. So is that adding to the confusion? I mean, why can't I turn on a, t a station and shop, shop around for the type of news that I want to hear? Matt? I mean, I think you're not <laughs> among journalism professors, uh, media critics, uh, people working in, in online or print legacy newsrooms, you're probably not going to find a lot of staunch defenders of cable news. Um, I think, uh, I think that my personal view is it's definitely not a, a good or healthy place to, uh, to get one's news, although of course there are exceptions and there are quality prog uh, programs on cable news. But uh, I think that it, it gets back to the, the point you were making a moment ago about bias. Uh, so certainly there, uh, there is all, almost always gonna be a perception of bias on any controversial story. You know, bias can be in the eye of the beholder a lot of times, uh, and it's going to be pretty hard to write a story about a controversial topic that won't get a news outlet accused of bias by someone or other. Someone's always going to have a problem with it. Um, you know, I've heard this from lots of the journalists I've talked to, you know, writing even about some foreign affairs issue, Israel-Palestine, you'll always be accused of bias no matter what you do, essentially. Um, but I think there's certainly a, a stronger narrative of a, of a liberal bias in the press, and it's, it's not new. It's certainly not something that, uh, that Donald Trump came up with. Um, it was new in the 1960s. Before that, everybody thought the press had a conservative bias, and there was some justification to that. Uh, but really, since the, the late 1960s, uh, this has been a, a big point of, um, of orthodoxy among many on the right that the press has a liberal bias. And you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an outlandish argument to make um, certainly, most working journalists are left-leaning in their personal beliefs. Many studies have shown this. It's just the question is, well, does that mean that they're deliberately, secretly trying to advance an agenda? Most people would say no. And most people working in the industry, that is, would say no. You know, does it mean that sometimes they allow their, their biases to come through in, in ways that are not good? Most people would probably admit yes. Um, some people would also say, well, sometimes they also bend over backwards too far the other direction because they know that they're liberal and so they're too accommodating. So I think it kind of uh, exists on a spectrum. But, but, but think about this. You said that you don't necessarily think that Fox and MSNBC or, or, or cable news, I think you said, is uh, a, the uh, best place to go for news. But many people do. In fact, Fox has been number one for consistently for years. And so when people go to Fox or they go to MSNBC, um, this is their um, perception of what news is, wouldn't you say? And so how do you, I mean, it is admitted bias, is, I guess is my point. You know, they make, you know, they, they make it clear. So that to me seems to be uh, something that's confusing to people and how do you get people to understand the difference? Why don't you tell, we have students here who are going to be um, starting their careers in journalists. Um, I don't know how well they, you know, get this, this thing about, you know, how different places like Fox News or MSNBC are from other media. So can, can somebody explain that? Why is that, why is that okay? And 
and how do you make sense out of it if that is your that is what you view as media who, who can address that well, people always, Jeff could probably say more about this than me, but people always um, answer differently when you ask them if they trust the media that they consume most often versus the media overall. Um, so people, you know, if you tune into ABC every night or you read your local newspaper every morning, whatever it is, you're going to say that they are more trustworthy than the media overall. Um, I will also say about Fox that one of the reasons people like it is because they're perceived as having an, an honesty about their bias. The fact that they're upfront about it, we found in, in interviews we've done with news consumers that they'll say, you know, I don't mind getting my news from Christian radio because they're telling me where they come from. And so I can, it's upfront, I can see that. And, and a lot of the pushback is about um, feeling like other journalists are hiding their bias rather than being upfront about it. Okay, so the, um, the press is very important to the democracy. And so that's why it concerns me so much that people don't believe it. Um, you have people who, um, who go to social media for their news and who knows where that comes from. How, how is it that you can really help people to understand whether something is legitimate as news or if something is intentional uh, uh, propaganda? How do you help people to, to understand that? Or is there any hope? I mean, maybe Joy can address this better than I, but uh, but I think it comes back to the the concept of news literacy, and I think there's certainly hope from the research I've seen. Uh, younger generations tend to have higher rates of news literacy than older generations, um, and in terms of you know how do you distinguish what is reliable content and what is not, um, a lot of it comes down to just paying close attention, right? You know, don't just see a headline that strikes you and retweet it, right? You know, click through to the story see if the story actually supports what the headline said or what the what the person on the internet said about the headline you know go click to what news outlet published this story you know google the name of that news outlet see if they have a wikipedia page go to their about us page and see if they actually have the names of all the editors listed if they say how their how their uh how their website is funded um that kind of thing uh, and certainly yeah, there's a lot, a lot of a lot of people doing that kind of work that that's is a lot of work <laughs> I think really? one of the That's what we have to go through. We have to do all of that sort of research just to find out whether when we read a story in a newspaper or turn on the TV, we can trust it. I, it, it just seems like there has to be another way. You know, people get their news uh, other ways. Um, we were talking about this uh, last week. Uh, somebody mentioned TMZ. Um, John Oliver, is that news? Last week tonight, is that news? Trevor Noah? I mean, do people go to uh, those places as news? And is that bad? Jeff, you have- Yeah, well, one thing I just wanna pick up on from the social media discussion is the role of brand in all of this on social media. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of people tell us all the time that brand is important to them being able to understand whether they trust something or not. As Joy, you were saying, people trust things that they are, that they trust the sources that they go to more than they're gonna trust other sources, which completely makes sense. But then when you start to figure out if they actually remember the, 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 the news brand, the news organization of a, a piece of news that they get digitally, you start to see a little bit of a different dynamic going on. And what we did in, in a certain study is we asked people, do you even remember the piece, the, the brand of a piece of news that you got in the past two hours? Um, and about a good amount of time they could tell us that, but when you start to look at social media, it was lower. And so we got to understand the question of where does how do some of these cues that people are using to understand whether something is trustworthy or not play out and how does it play out differently in these different venues? Now, in terms of the satirical news, we have some data that's going back a little bit old that looks at um, Jon Stewart when he was in, at The Daily Show and looked at Colbert Report. Mm -hmm. And we do see that, that there was a good amount of people that were getting that getting those places um, for get, going to those sources for places of news. Now they may go there for different reasons. They may go there for being entertained versus instead of getting an in-depth um, in, 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 in depth story, but they are going there for news. Now there are differences in the populations that tend to go there. Um, they tend to be a little bit more liberal. They tend to be a little bit more male, um, younger, um, but they are um, um, news for some people. Okay. 
Um, we, we, I'm gonna, we, we're getting some questions in right now. Um, one of them is, do you think news outlets are, news outlets are also trying to cater to the entertainment aspect of how people consume media? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, fundamentally, it's also often a business and success is gauged at least in part on how you reach people. And so, I mean, this is, it's always been true. Like back before internet analytics, oh my gosh, we're going to sound like old people. Back in my day, like I, like you publish a huge investigation that you worked on for months, but you get more calls when you mess up the crossword puzzle, right? Like people have always <laughs> turned to news for a variety of reasons. And we all are interested in both like recaps of The Bachelor and, um, you know, more serious information. Like it's, it's, it's always going to be a mix. And, and it's not wrong of journalists to want to reach an audience and to do things in a way that is easy to consume, that break, breaks things down, that people want to read or watch. Like there's nothing wrong with that. I think it comes back to like honesty of purpose. Okay. Um, I have another uh, question that I find really interesting. We say all the time and, and, um, and, and studies bear this out that local media is more trusted than national. Uh, Jeff, you guys have done research on that, right? Are you aware of any research that talks about that? The question is why? Why do people trust their local news more than national? Um, we do have data that just show that local does tend to be somewhat more trusted um, than national does. Um, and the why is, is, is an interesting question um, because there are also issues that people do see with local news as well. And so for example, what we do see with local news is that a lot of people do think it's important that journalists are connected to their, to their communities, but we see sometimes that they sometimes don't feel that. Um, and so um, there are, there are um, interesting um, dynamics. There are a number of indications that we've seen in some of our local work that, that um, Americans do think that local news organizations do do well at a number of different roles um, in and, and how they're actually do and how they're actually um, delivering the news. And so there are, are um, a number of places in which they do rate local news um, fairly well. Um, in a number of places. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I, I think that um, I don't have the direct comparison, but there are some indications that the that local news does do well among a number of dimensions. Right. Um, Joy, you deal with a lot of local news organizations, right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you could add to that, the discussion? We, about I mean, we have found the same thing to be true. One thing that I find really interesting, whether we're talking about local or national, is what we mean by news. And I mean, it's easy to get a little esoteric here, but like one of the things we work on with local news organizations is getting across the point of, of what you cover. So like people claim bias when they see a political story that they think isn't fair, right? Often, let me just point out, you claim that when it's one you don't agree with. You don't hear claims of bias when people when a story reflects what somebody thinks, they don't claim bias. They only say that, right? So, but they don't claim bias around like a story explaining how the traffic circle going in at the next exit on the interstate is going to work, mm -hmm. or um, you know what happened at the local school board meeting. Although the pandemic is making everything political, and we are seeing local news get accusations around like exaggerating the pandemic. Um, but I think that like when when you talk about bias in news, let me just let me just more more articulately say. Often what people have in mind is political coverage, and there's a lot more to news than that, which makes it difficult, I think, to have fair comparisons. Um, Matt, um, one of our attendees is asking, what will journalism look like in five years? Do you have any idea? I know you're a historian. But <laughs> yeah, I specialize in the past in the and not the future, but, yeah. uh, but no, I, I mean, uh, how much will things change in the next five years? Uh, based on the trends we've been seeing in the past five years, uh, it seems like probably more, uh, more pain and more cuts for local legacy news organizations, um, probably more news outlets moving toward a subscription-based revenue model, right? Uh, ads, especially with the pandemic and cut down and you know, related economic distress and cut down in ad spending, uh, more and more um, outlets are gonna be turning to their to their readers and, and listeners uh, for revenue, more, more podcasts, 
So, but what's um, that going to yeah. look like? I'm sorry. When I turn on the TV and when I pick up the newspaper, mm -hmm. or is there a newspaper for me to pick up? Yeah. So when I think when you turn on the TV, I think it'll look the same. Uh, you know, they, they've been doing the same thing for 20 years, um, and they're still making money, uh, especially in, uh, in the Trump era, they're making more money. Uh, so I think that'll look the same. Um, the newspaper will probably, you know, it, it, that's been getting, the, the quality has been getting lower and the price has been getting higher. And a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, with the ownership models and hedge fund ownership that probably we don't need to get into here. Um, but I think one hopeful possibility is that you see more kind of shoestring startup operations, you know, like when the local newspaper gets gutted, you know, some the former journalists get together and form a high quality online venture. I mean, I think just today I saw the former um, the former staff of uh, of Deadspin, the the sports and commentary website, are starting a new venture, sort of cooperative venture, uh, where they have um, you know they're going to have ownership stakes and and uh, and editorial control. Um, so I do think we'll see more more stuff like that on the positive side of the ledger. One of the interesting things, if I can just jump in there, sure. is that with a lot of this discussion around finances is that the public seems to be quite unaware of the finances mm -hmm. of um, news organizations. And so when we were going back to some of the local news stuff that we did, we saw like a vast majority of Americans saying that the new, that local news organizations are doing fairly well in the finances, right. um, which is a little bit different than what we may expect. Um, additionally, we asked a question um, recently about what the impact of the, of the pandemic was on local news organizations. And a third of people flat out told us, I have no clue. And so we see there that there may be a disconnect with what's actually going with the finances of the industry and what the perceptions in the public actually is. I do like um, your, your answer, um, Matt, about um, how journalists in local areas are coming together uh, when a, like a newspaper goes out of business and form a high quality uh, online um, product. Because you do see that happening on a national level. And I wondered if that's the future of uh, journalism, um, that it would be online and that it would be uh, funded by a nonprofit where, you know, there are no shareholders. Is that, you know, that, that sounds, yeah. I guess, yeah. kind of hopeful. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we've seen, we've, you know there, there are large uh, metropolitan news outlets that have already moved to a nonprofit footing, you know, the um, the Salt Lake Tribune is one. Um, the the Philadelphia Inquirer is now owned by a nonprofit. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think we're definitely seeing the the decline of local ad supported media um, with that traditional business model that that reigned for such a long time. And there's there's pluses and minuses to that. You know, obviously yeah. the minus of the subscription model is that well you know, it's only available to people who are, who are willing to pay. So a lot of it is going to be behind a paywall. But then again, it's still a lot cheaper than a print newspaper was back in the day to subscribe to online sites like this. So, uh, so maybe it's not the end of the world. Well, here's my, here's, here's my fear, that there will be a lot of people who will not want to pay um, because a lot of people feel like if it's online, why should I have to pay for it? You know, I already pay for my uh, internet service. But my, my fear is that people will say, no, I'm not going to pay for it because I can find it for free elsewhere. And that's where we get into trouble because they, go, they turn to Twitter, they turn to Facebook, and who knows the origins of, of this news. So, you know, I guess I'm a little hopeful, but then thinking about human, human behavior, it, it, draw, it draws me back to being concerned again. <laughs> well, I really think that as newsrooms, um, I mean, we're so strapped for staff and as Matt alluded to, likely to, that's like, that situation is likely to just get worse. I think we're going to have to be much more ruthless about what we cover and not do a lot of the stuff that people can mm. get for free. Like if there's another news outlet or, you know, if you're a newspaper and a TV station in town is really good at like traffic updates and accident reports, just seed the territory. Like just, to, and, and you invest more time in what you do that other people don't do. I think I get really excited to work with mm. niche organizations and startups and people who know exactly what role they serve. I think the people who are really suffering are the organizations that try to be everything to everybody for a metro area. Um, and I think you have to be able to make a really honest, persuadable case that what you're doing is worth paying for because it's unique. And those, that's going to lead to some 
I think there's some hard conversations that need to happen in newsrooms around what you could stop doing. Given that this, uh, this session is targeted to students, um, what is it that you feel that um, students need to know? They're about to get out there and face the real world and, and try to do journalism. Is there anything that um, they need to know that we can tell them or that you guys can tell them? Joy, you, you talk to news organizations all the time. Yeah, um, man, right? I, have, I have, yeah, definitely. I think that if, um, I mean, my first goal is for journalists to feel a sense of responsibility about earning trust, not assuming that it's automatic, but that it's up to them to demonstrate why they're worthy of trust. So man, my wish for all the folks watching today is that when you go on to job interviews, ask questions like that. Like, how do you guys work to be fair and to be worthy of your community's trust? If your community asks you questions about how you decide what to cover, about your ethics, like how can they learn about you? Search around on that news organ's website. Do they have an about page that, as Matt was saying, like says who they're funded by and what their mission is and who their staff is? Can you contact them? Like try to work places that share, um, that have a sensibility around being accessible and about being um, accountable to their community in a real way. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I might add to this and I, I hope that, uh, that journalism students will get it. This is part of their education too, but uh, just the importance of, of talking to people, listening to people, taking their views seriously, uh, representing, that make sure you're representing their views as, uh, as clearly and fairly as possible. You know, don't be uh, hesitant to ask people to repeat something if you don't know what they said. You know, people will be will be happy to clarify what they said rather than run the risk of having it uh, misinterpreted. Um, and just to come into everything with uh, with an open mind. Um, you know, be open to hearing people, their ideas, um, and spell their names right. Double check na double check name spellings. <laughs> Anything that you could add uh, to that, Jeff? I know that you're a data guy. Yes, I am a data guy. And we at the Pew Research Center don't provide recommendations or anything. But what I can say is um, that um, there are a lot of part, there are a lot of dynamics that are in the in the in the U.S. about perceptions and um, around views of the institution. Um, and I think it, it's really important to be really well read up on what those are, what the, what the, what the public actually thinks, um, where those divides exist, where they are not just politically, but where they are in other um, populations and what are the priorities um, of certain groups and what are the, what are the feelings and, 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 and how they view journalism. I think that's really important to be really read up on not just the partisan divides, but where there are, are other rifts in the country as well. Um, one of the attendees is, uh, has written a question about uh, the consolidation of media companies and are we going to get to the point that there's you know, just a few big companies controlling um, the news that we get. Um, you know, I, I hope that that doesn't happen or at least it's far, far away, uh, but I do, I do think it's a legitimate concern. I mean, you already see a handful of companies buying up a lot of uh, local newspapers. Um, any concerns there? And, and does this um, shut out, what does this do to local news when these big corporate uh, uh, entities uh, gobble up um, these smaller news organizations? And this get the talent too. This is a long-term trend too, certainly. And it's, and it's something that uh, a lot of people in the industry and academics have been you know, wringing their hands over since, you know, since at least 1980. Um, and, uh, and I, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the best, um, the best, I guess, defense against the, the problems that can come from too much consolidation of news are, are simply the, um, you know, the integrity of the journalists, these individual news outlets that, um, you know, and, and you do see it sometimes when, um, you know, when ownership is, uh, is you know asking them to to do something unethical or or to you know abdicate their journalistic responsibilities? They they'll often um, you know push back sometimes at at significant risk to their careers. Um, so so yes yes it's a problem. <laughs> I don't have I don't have the solution though. All right, another question: How can we make citizen journalists aware of the ethics and standards that one should consider when covering a story? <laughs> 
I guess um, from, in my mind, it depends on where that journalism is likely to end up. Like if a news organization is going to, if, if professional journal, I think citizen journalism is, or I think uh, information gathered by people as they're out and about in their lives plays a really important role. I think if a news organization is going to amplify that or share it, they need to have a system in place to, to, to know where it came from and verify that it's real. It's their credibility on the line if they choose to amplify. Um, but I don't, I, I tend to think, I tend to put the responsibility on the journalists more than on news consumers or people who are um, sharing something not knowing that it's true, right? So this, so recently, like somebody told me something and I passed it on because I trusted that person, but she doesn't have the same sense of, she didn't have the same like belief in facts that I did, right? So she was being a little more careless with her facts than I would. But if I choose to pass it on, that's on me. So I think that happens with journalism sometimes that whether we're quoting someone or embedding a tweet in a story or like, it's up to us. This, the same way it would be if somebody told us on the phone to know whether something is true and if that person's really in a position to know it. Okay. So um, we, we touched on this a bit, but somebody mentioned news literacy. Um, what, what can we do to help people sort out all of this? You know, who to go to? You know, somebody in the chat said, is this, um, is this a good place to go for news? How do we sort that out? How do we help people to understand that? And as somebody who is, um, who is about to start a journalism career, how do you pick the places that you want to go that you feel match your own standards? Any advice? There are basic journalism principles that are true for most of us and certainly true for everywhere I've worked that are not universal and not taken for granted by news consumers. So um, do we pay our sources for their time or do they pay us to be included? Um, do we purposefully suppress some stories and highlight other stories? Do we, um, you know, do we, uh, when we quote an anonymous source, do we know who that person is or are they anonymous to us, which some people think? Um, you know, do, this, do the same people write, what is the difference between news and opinion content? Basic tenets of journalism that we can no longer assume that our audience understands and we don't do enough to educate them about that. So a lot of trusted news, I'll stick a link to our newsletter in there because the archive has a ton of just really quick tips for journalists. Um, but what we're trying to teach journalists to do is to embed the sort of transparency around that into the work. So in your newsletter, um, say, I don't know if we have any USC folks on, in the house, but uh, we did an experiment with, their, with Annenberg Student Media in their newsletter. Um, you know, say, here's why we did this story, or here's a decision we made when doing this story. Here's how we work to be fair in this story. Here's how we report on polls, and you, so that you know if we include a poll in our story, here's how we're sure that it's valid. Here's why you can trust Pew. Like, just embedding that sort of literacy, um, not a separate course, not a separate page that explains how journalism works. That stuff could be really nice, but take advantage of attention where you have it, and in your stories or in your comment sections, um, answer questions and be ready to explain what rules you follow and what makes your work credible. I would love, I really want to harp on comments for just a second, if you don't mind, Rod, because I think that um, a lot of times we let our detractors have the last word about our work. If we are not present in comment sections saying, oh, actually, let me explain to you that that's not true, or you might have missed in the story this, or here's why our ethics would prevent us from doing that, and here's where you can read more about our ethics. We miss the chance when we don't engage in comments to defend our work. Um, and remember that when you take time to answer comments, you're not just answering the rude person who left the hateful comment, you're answering everybody else who's reading who might have the same question, but better intentions. Right. <laughs> I, I do want to point out that you mentioned anonymous sources and, you, uh, and the distinction between news and opinion. I just want to point out that those are future topics uh, in this webinar uh, series. So thanks. Um, Can I touch yeah? upon one thing that Joy, you mentioned, just to touch upon the fact opinion divide is that um, don't take for granted that audiences will know the difference between the two. Um, and um, we did a study a couple years back that actually just flat out asked people 10 statements and said, hey, tell me if this is a fact, a factual statement, tell me if this is an opinion statement. And what you see is that um, there were five factual statements, five opinion statements, and what you saw is that yes, most people can get most of them right, but that's three out of five. Um, very few people can get all five 
factual statements right, all five opinion statements right, and there are various reasons why people aren't getting them right, but don't take for granted that people will be able to understand what the distinction is between when you write something up, what a factual statement is, and what an opinion statement is. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, another question here is um, considering that the biggest economic crisis is just beginning uh, by making people pay for something that's not essential, you know, basically what we do, um, uh, such as food and water and utilities, healthcare, doesn't that mean that the most vulnerable groups are just going to be left behind? That's I mean, to some extent, that is a sad reality. However, I'd point out that there are still a lot of high quality news outlets that are and probably will remain available for free online. Um, I mean, two of the biggest newsrooms in the country employing more journalists than almost anybody else are the Associated Press um, and, uh, and NPR, National Public Radio. Uh, and those, those are, are free and high quality, I assume will remain so. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, from, from the UK, there's uh, The Guardian, which part of its mission, this, now they do have a, a political viewpoint. Um, they do have, a, uh, they're open about their left leaning viewpoint, but The Guardian and the BBC are gonna remain free. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it kind of has always been that way. You know, there's that silly saying from early in the internet era, that information wants to be free and it's just not true. It's never been true. You know, inform high quality information generally has not been free. Um, and that's, if, the, if there aren't people paying for it, then it's not going to, it's not going to get reported in many cases. Yeah, people need to know what's going on though. Um, how do you convince your family and friends to trust the media? My parents think negatively of journalists and always were that I would become a biased CNN reporter. Mm -hmm. How do you get your family to, to trust them? I think this is somebody who's uh, starting out soon. What, what do you say to your family and friends when you say, hey, I'm going to be a reporter? They're like, oh, no. I mean, I think it would go back to a lot of what, uh, what Joy was saying about the importance of of transparency and actually explaining some of these specifics of uh, of how um, of how journalism works and how people do the job, and that it's not uh, it's not a one one size fits all kind of thing. You know, it's, the press isn't a monolith, right? Um, you know, just because you dislike this one opinion show on cable news, it doesn't mean that that's what all of journalism is. Um, and to try to you know say, oh hey, did you you know find an interesting story about in in the local newspaper about you know, oh, the, about how the town's responding to the pandemic or, um, or whatever else it is and say, hey, did you see this story? Isn't this interesting the way they reported this? You notice how many different people they talked to and, you know, uh, and little examples like that of, um, of the, the ways that, that journalism works on, on the smaller scale. Because, you know, after all, most people who go into journalism don't wind up with as a talking head on CNN anyhow. I think that, um, you know, wherever wherever that that students parents get their news is also part of the media so i think that that can often be a powerful way to start the conversation and say like how do you decide what to trust um and what are you looking for and then i just look for ways to really hammer home some of the basic points we've been talking about here like what's on their about page do they correct errors somebody sent me something recently that showed that their local newspaper you know look they got this so wrong and i was like yes but did you notice that there's a prominent correction and the correction was also shared and um, not all news outlets do that. You should pay attention to whether when something is wrong, it's corrected because that's not universal. Um, so I think that being critical of news is, is, as I said at the beginning, really important and valued. Um, and it's just about figuring out what would you need to see to make this trustworthy? What are you looking for and having a conversation about that? What are you afraid will happen? And to sort of um, 
bring back something that I just, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, but also Matt was something, some of the stuff that you were saying is that this is not a monolith, that the media, it, it, we talk about the media as if it is one thing. And so we always talk about when we're talking about measures of trust, again, we're talking about a very blunt measure, but we're not seeing all the dimensions that are underlying all of that. The same thing when you talk about blunt evaluations of the media versus more specific things of what you're talking about. So for example, yes, we can ask about broad measures of confidence. We can talk about broad measures of ethics and so forth. And you tend to get lower responses to that. But then you sort of go in further and you say, well, what do you think about the coverage of the, the pandemic so far? Are, are you getting the information that you need? Are you, and you start to see in, in, in the public, you start to see quite different answers when you start to get a lot more specific. Um, and we saw that really play out very clearly in views of how the news media is covering the pandemic versus their more broader views of the institution as a whole, is that you really start to get a really different dynamic playing out. Okay, um, interesting question here. Um, how do you give people's views a fair perspective when their views are dangerous or bigoted or conspiracy theories? I think that, um, I think that the press had to reevaluate how to cover the president for some of these reasons. Um, um, one of the things that he'll share something on Twitter that is a conspiracy theory and the press covers that. Well, ha -ha. anybody can address her, her question? I mean, different people will have different answers to that. And I think it's, uh, it's a matter of opinion in some measure uh, how news outlets should, uh, should respond, but they, news outlets do need to be mindful of their power to, to amplify views, right? And, and they need to be selective in, uh, in which views they amplify. Um, so, I mean, there's different approaches that, that some people would advise. Some would say, uh, you know, if they're espousing a hateful or, uh, or dangerous idea, you know, they should, that, that shouldn't be included at all. Others might say, well, you should include it, but you should also include an explainer about why this is, uh, you know, why this is inaccurate or offensive. Um, Others will say, you know, just put it out there in, in the light and, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant is the, uh, is the cliche um, and, you know, let people see for themselves how, um, how abhorrent it is and they'll, they'll realize. Um, so, uh, so again, I don't, I don't know that there's a, a one size fits all approach, but it's definitely important for journalists to be aware at least of, of, uh, of the power that they have to, to amplify um, people's voices, you know, for, for better and for worse. Does um, everybody deserve to have a voice? Everybody does on social media already. <laughs> <laughs> everyone deserves to, I mean, everyone can find their own platform, but in terms of whose voices journalists choose to amplify, that's always been a matter of judgment. Um, who has something to say that we think the community needs to hear? Um, I worked for a boss who had a great, he, his favorite way to describe journalism was a community in conversation with itself which I really appreciate. And I think that especially on the local level, um, you know, as sort of arbiters of, of what's included in that conversation, it's important to include divergent viewpoints. That doesn't mean that if you get guest columns sent in every day from someone who denies climate science, um, that, that they deserve to be heard. There always is a judgment about, is this, um, you know, is it based on fact? Is it helpful? Does it move community conversations forward? And that's always gonna be a matter of, um, of both professional standards and personal judgment. So it's right that, that journalists get questioned about who they choose to. Um, I think the scrutiny is, is appropriate in terms of who gets to be included, um, but also, um, no, it's certainly not everybody. Mm. Well, I think that that could lead to people saying that there's the press going against showing their bias, you know, because there are people who don't believe in climate change and uh, to say, well, we're going to exclude you because it is a fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. I mean, there are also people who believe in white supremacy. And that doesn't mean that they um, deserve to have their voices heard. That they, that I think there are ways to do responsible journalism around fringe groups and around things that are a danger to society and things that are harmful. I think they, um, th those need to be handled very carefully. 
Um, but you know, there, there are protest groups that will show up just to get attention. And that doesn't mean that every local journalist needs to show up and give them attention, right? I think it's, it's always a judgment about what is appropriate and what is good for the health of the community. And it's absolutely fair to say, to question whether, that's a lot of responsibility for journalists to have. We should acknowledge that and we shouldn't take it seriously. I mean, we should take it seriously and we should be transparent about it with our audience. Here's how we decide what to cover. That is the number one thing we see in questions to newsrooms and when we interview news consumers about what they wanna know, how do you decide what to cover? And you know what? We often don't have a good answer. There's mm -hmm. no algorithm or rubric. Too often it's like, well, someone called in sick or this editor drove past something on their way to work and thought we should write a story about it. <laughs> like we're not, we're not transparent enough and consistent enough in that. And we need to talk a lot more about what makes something news when we choose not to cover something. We've worked with newsrooms who have said, here's why we don't report on every threat of this variety. Because it can cause copycats, because it alarms people unnecessarily. Here's when we will cover it. We need to be consistent about that and then talk about why we do it. And then also to just to jump off of that as well, when you decide to cover something, the question is, and, and it may be something that is inaccurate, that the public does put a lot of weight on the press to then play that fact checking role. And so there is a vast majority of Americans do say it is a responsibility of, a, of the press that when they do cover an inaccuracy to actually then be doing that fact checking as well. I guess the the thing that I'm, I'm, some people might be thinking, uh, Joy, um, when you use white supremacy as an example of, you know, voices that we don't necessarily have to cover, uh, then that raises the question, where do we draw, draw the line? Um, people might think that everything that uh, Joe Biden says is good for the nation, so we're going to mute all the other voices. You know, it's, you know, and if a white supremacy group is going to have um, a protest or some big march, how do you cover that? I assume that you do cover it, right? You have to cover, you know, you know, 500 people get together and, and march through the city. I mean, you- Man, you have 500 white supremacists in your city. I sure hope you're covering it beyond <laughs> live coverage, right? Like, I hope that's an issue you're addressing. And I hope you're putting some context around that and being super thoughtful in how you cover it beyond just, here are pictures of the white supremacists and beyond just dictating what they say right. to you. Right. Th that's the point that I'm trying to make. The word that you said, context, that's what's really important. It's not, it's not good enough to just say this happened. You need to talk about what it means, the possible impact, the history of it, um, and how does it reflect on your community. Those are things that people want to say. So it, it is, it, it is a way to do it and, and you have to um, you have to provide context. Uh, we've had some really good questions. Um, um, we have, we're almost out of time though. Um, just want to see before we before we end, just want to give you guys a chance to to say anything that hasn't come up naturally in our discussion here. I'll start off with you, uh, Jeff. Is there anything that that you've wanted to say but uh, I've ignored you and not let you say it. Um, I actually want to talk about uh, 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 taking off something that I sort of alluded to earlier is that mm -hmm. differences in populations in um, what they expect or what they view of the news media. And I want to speak to something that we recently sort of looked at was in, and, and this would be particularly important in, in people who are rising up in the field, is the feeling of whether people are understood or misunderstood by the news media. And so what we do see a lot of times is that the public overall tends to think that they that news organizations don't understand people like them. Mm -hmm. And um, this comes up, um, and what we wanted to do differently this time when we asked this question is we want to understand what people don't, people think that the news media don't understand about them. And so we asked them sort of, we ask them, is it because of your political views? Is it you don't understand them because of your social and economic class, your personal interests, or is it because of your personal characteristics, like such as demographics? And what we saw is that that answer really differed by certain groups. Mm -hmm. that, and that answer differed um, notably by racial or ethnic groups. And so, and this is really important considering a lot of the conversations that are going on right now, is we saw, for example, that um, 
um, black Americans were far more likely to be saying than, than white and Hispanic Americans that the misunderstanding is of their race or of other uh, or of another demographic characteristic. And for example, white Americans were more likely to tell us that the misunderstanding was of their political beliefs. And so clearly there are differences in what people are perceiving as and how they're connecting to the news media in different ways. Um, and so I think it's a really important to consider how different populations are interacting and connecting with um, news outlets. Um, what you just reminded me is that our session uh, on Tuesday of next week, will talk about one aspect of what you just mentioned, and that is coverage of uh, uh, communities of color and um, yeah, you know, how, how those voices are, are, are being heard, to what extent, and whether they're being heard. Um, Matt? Uh, yeah, one thing I would maybe like to leave attendees with uh, is just that it's not necessarily worse now than things were in the past. Uh, lack of credibility, the public mistrust of the press has been a really, really long-standing concern of journalists, um, certainly back at least 50 years. And back when the public did trust the press more, maybe they didn't deserve it anyway. And uh, we're fortunate today that there are many things that uh, the journalists can do to try to, uh, to earn and or regain uh, the, the trust of the public. And a, a lot of it starts uh, as, as Joy and, and the rest of us have been saying with, uh, with transparency. Okay, Joy? Yeah, I, I guess my parting word would be to, to, to reiterate that mistrust is sometimes valid. Um, a lot of communities, communities of color, just leading into your conversation next week, have been truly harmed by journalists. Um, journalists get things wrong all the time. As you enter a newsroom, not only do you need to understand how people feel about your newsroom right now, you need to understand why people feel that way and what maybe historical baggage you're unfortunately walking into and therefore held responsible for. When you show up at a business to do a story about their, um, you know, their remodel, they might still be mad that somebody misstated their, the hours they were open when they opened 10 years ago and, you know, said they were open on a day they weren't and all these angry customers showed up, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, you can, that doesn't mean that it's your fault. It does mean that being uh, just the reminder of the huge immense power you have that newsrooms have in communities and that when people are skeptical, that's valid. And when they are mad, they might have a very good reason for that. And so do come in with some humility um, and with a real desire to earn their trust. Very well said. Okay, well, I really want to thank you, uh, Jeff, Joy, and, and Matt. I think it was a good discussion. I hope that the students who are listening to us got something out of this. Um, there were a few questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, feel free to uh, send me an email and we can, um, we can have some discussions about anything that, that, that didn't come up, um, that we didn't get, get a chance to talk about here. I do want to again uh, remind everybody that we will be here next Tuesday. That is August 4th, but the time is gonna be different. It'll be two to three Eastern time. <clears throat> and we have some really good, uh, interesting guests, not as good as these guests, but it's, good. it's a good panel assembled. So thank you guys and thank everybody who um, joined us today. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you.